Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's Christmas time. Amen. You got to love the season. At least you should. As we come to a time of celebrating the, the Lord and his birth. You know, it's always a, a mixed bag when it comes to pastors and preaching and messages. You know, uh, I know we just pretty much say this message of Christmas for Christmas season. It's a message we really preach in one way or the other all year long. And it's, it's a message worthy of it. I know some pastors who think, well, you know, you just, uh, you can just, you know, uh, it's Sunday after Sunday for weeks here. Whoa, I don't know what's going on there. Fix that for me, would you? All right. I'll turn the reverb off or whatever that one happened over there. But anyway, it's a time in the season. A lot of people think, well, you can over-preach a message. You can never over-preach the message, especially when you preach the entire message. And the entire message has to do with the, the whole of the gospel. That not only was he born... But he came and he lived a perfect and sinless life. And not only did he come and lived a perfect, sinless life, he also went to the grave. And he was, you know, first of all, crucified and then buried and then raised. But that's still not the end of the story. It ends with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and ultimately the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth. That's the, the gospel message in its entirety. So, you know, you don't want to miss the whole of the message of Christmas. Everybody's sitting around talking about what they want for Christmas these days. You know, we're living in a day when people are out shopping and doing all their stuff. If they're not filling up the malls or, you know, burning up the Internet and Amazon, Walmart.com and all these other things. And, you know, it's a little different today. You have your list. You know, y'all, y'all do the Amazon list and, the, you know, my share list. My kids like share list. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm in the share list. They, uh, I pressured, I'm pressured into it, but I'm not big on share list. Whatever happened to the excitement and the surprise? But I want to get you what you want. Well, whoever said it was about getting what I want, start with. So I've titled today's message, All I Could Want for Christmas. And I want you to know all I could want for Christmas, I got. And that's what makes it so glorious and so special. So I want to talk to you about a message uh, of all I could want for Christmas and see if it fits up upon your list anywhere. In fact, why don't you put it on your share list and see how this goes? <laughs> Can I get an amen? I want to start the message, you know, obviously with what the Apostle Paul said when he talked about the, the, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to run that for me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, it says, Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now, Obviously, it must be a speakable gift on some level because he's speaking about it. But what he means by this is, I mean, how, do, how can you explain? How, do, how can you describe? How can you tell the, the whole of what this gift means? This gift of Jesus is obviously what he's talking about here. The Lord Jesus Christ, how can you even begin to tell the story? There's so much. Even John wrote in the Gospels, says, said, this is just a portion. If, it, if everything that he had done, even in his earthly ministry, was written out, there wouldn't be enough books to fill it. I mean, because he's done so much. And he's demonstrated so much. But so if I go through this, this unspeakable gift, it all is in a person. It's, it's the Lord Jesus himself. But wrapped up in this person of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's, there's some things about Christmas and the gift of Christmas that I really want us to see this morning. And especially not to miss as we enter this season, this time where we're celebrating Christmas so that we do not forget the joy of this season and the glory of this season and the excitement and the wonder of Christmas. Don't ever get over it, amen? Let's talk, start with this one. Where it's, it's an announcement from the angels. I don't know why I keep picking that up. It's not work for me. You have to pay attention back there, all right? <laughs> the angels tell us in Luke chapter 2, they said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, catch the scene quiet community, nothing going on out in the fields. Sheep are being put away into the pens, which were normally the caves in the atmosphere. Shepherds are standing watch over their flocks. And all of a sudden, the sky bursts forth with light and wonder and sounds of this holy host of angels that are speaking. Certainly, the first two words are important if you're the guy standing here watching this. This is not the day of multimedia, all right? This is not the day of great visual effects and sound effects, all right? This is the time of Jesus. And the skies light up and the heaven light up and the voices of the angels are heard and the singing breaks forth. And so the first words are appropriate. Fear not. Because this would pretty much freak you out, I would think, right? I don't know about you, but with me, it, 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 even today with all the likes and sound and multimedia, this would still freak me out. And then they deliver the message for, for I bring you good tidings of great what? Great what? Joy. Come on, say it again. Joy. Joy. Act like you have some. 
<laughs> which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The greatest news break, breaking announcement the media has ever put out, the world has ever heard, is right here. I'm bringing you some exciting news. In fact, this news is so exciting, let's, let's categorize it as under joyful. I'm, this is great joy. Glad tidings, a good story, good news is here. There's a Savior. There's salvation. Hope is available. And he says, and he wraps up like, it is great joy. That's certainly a, a good word for that. Next slide says, it's present joy. And what's so present about the joy? If you know Jesus Christ, I mean, you really have a relationship with Him, God has done, done something supernatural, many facets to it, many parts of it, all right? But the, one of the most obvious parts to every person upon receiving Christ Jesus ought to be this, 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 this element, this essence of joy that is in their life because they've found forgiveness of their sins, because they've, they've found the Lord Jesus, because hope is certain now. Reality of, of, of death is, is not to be feared anymore. There's joy in this message. We have joy. Now, you need, some of you today obviously need to send yourself an email and notify yourself. If that don't work, tweet yourself, email yourself, Snapchat yourself, whatever it takes, get the word. There's joy. <laughs> Were y'all being baptized in vinegar this morning? <laughs> joy. I mean, I mean, this song, I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart, I've got that joy. Oh, give yourself a hand. But better, better than that, you do have joy. You say, well, I don't feel, it hasn't got anything to do with my feelings today. There's this deep abiding sense in my life. There's joy. There's going to be a lot of things happen in this world around me. There's a lot of things that are in despair around me. But as a Christian right here, right now, I have joy. Why? Because I don't live my life according to the flesh, as it says in Romans 8. I have a new life. I have, I am because of my relationship to Jesus, I am a spiritual being as well as a physical being. I didn't used to have spiritual life, but when Christ came in, He gave me a spiritual life, and part of the package is joy. I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Now, sometimes it needs to erupt, so this would be a good day for that. Have a little joy. I bring you glad news, great news, good tidings, that unto you is born a Savior. A Savior. Thank God for that. You're going to hell without a Savior. Your life will be hell without a Savior. You've got joy in your life. Enjoy the joy. But not only that, there's a future joy. It says this in Psalm 16, in whose presence is fullness of joy. It's good to know that today I have a lot of people that I've loved over the years, and even this week some have passed away that I've known who are now standing in the presence of God. I mean, you know, and there's grief and sadness and sorrow on this side of eternity, but I want you to know nobody there is crying today, all right? There is the, abs the, the absence of that sorrow and the presence of extreme joy. In fact, he, the, the writer, David, says it's in his presence. There is fullness of joy. I mean, we have joy now. But can you imagine that one day when you step to the veil and you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death and you step into the glorious presence of God, that you're not going to be filled with joy? I tell you, you won't be looking like you look this morning. <laughs> Hopefully, amen. <laughs> There's going to be something about your life. It's, not, it's so it's in the, the sanctification, the glorification, the presence of God, the absence of, of, the, of temptation and of sin, the sorrows of the age. You're going to be in the very presence of joy. That, it's a pretty good Christmas gift. I'll take, put that on my share list. <laughs> Amen. And you say, well, you already got it. Now, I think, and you do too, hopefully. It's time to open the gift. <laughs> Enjoy the joy. I think sometimes we forget, we get stuck in the mundane of living and the, 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 the boredom of life sometimes, we forget there's joy in Jesus Christ. It's not artificial. 
It's a real joy, and it doesn't have to do with my circumstances. It doesn't have anything to do with what you think about me or I think about you. It doesn't have anything to do with, with the stock market. Praise God, it's up, but hey, it could be down next month. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the weather. It could rain here in a minute. Who cares? I have joy. I have what I need in Christ. Future joy. The second part of this gift from the Lord is, is this gift of hope. He says here, I bring you great good tidings of joy. I want you to know this is a message of hope for the believer. It's the message of Christmas. It's the message of Christ. The message of hope to, to people who don't know God. It's a message of hope to people who, you know, we are fallen in our sin. We're con- a condemned race, humanity is. There's no hope without Jesus Christ. Man will go ultimately into that condemned eternity without God, with nothing but sorrow and pain and suffering, all due to the fact that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's, that's, that's what awaits every person unless they realize Jesus Christ and His offer of hope. And it's a hope that it's not just kind of, man, I hope it works out. It's not that kind of, you know, that East Texas, well, I hope so kind of thing. This, this, the biblical hope and the Christian hope is something that is not kind of, well, there's an expectation, maybe it might, maybe it not. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's based upon a certainty. My hope is sure. My hope is certain because it's not based upon man or emotions or circumstances or human events. My hope is built upon the promises of God. And upon what Christ Jesus Christ, what he has completed for me in giving his life and being raised from the dead, my hope is certain. So I know that no matter what I'm going through today, and you may be going through something today, but listen, no matter what you're going through today, no matter what you're having to face when the sun comes up on Monday morning, no matter what the bill collectors might be saying, no matter what the doctors told you, no matter what the news is dictating to you, you have a hope that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. You have hope. You have hope. Now, I don't know what you're sitting on your hands for, you got hope. And it's time to somehow peel off the layers of that deadness and coldness of our old flesh and say, why am I living like a lost person? I'm a child of the redeemed. I belong to God. My life is in His hands. My hope is certain. I'm not wishing for something. It's settled. It's certain. And it's based upon the authority and the promises of God. There's hope. There's hope. And it's a hope that not only of what's in eternity that it's sailed, but it sustains me even now in this life. And it even comforts me at the grave if I'm standing there with some, or if it's my grave that I go to. It sustains me in all these things. And we should, we should realize that because there are times that we deal with issues and there's things that we, we suffer and there's things that we experience and there's losses that we have to, to go through. There's trials and difficulties and pains and discomforts of life on every hand. There's so many things that seek to rob and to steal our joy from us. Every day, it seems like that war goes on. But you come back to the place of promise. You come back to the place of Christmas. You come back to the promise of hope and of God's grace and God's joy. And you stand in that and you remember that and you recite that and you'll you'll begin to happen. That joy and that hope will begin to spring forth. I love what Paul the Apostle is telling the church in Corinth is he's talking about, hey, that we suffer loss and we, we, we grieve over those that we love or people that we've lost in life. He said, I just don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, he tells them in 1 Thessalonians. Don't, don't, don't be ignorant concerning those that who've gone to sleep, those who've died. He said, don't sorrow like people who have no hope. And he says, don't grieve. That's not what he's saying, don't grieve. He said, don't grieve like people who have no hope. Our grieving is different from people who don't know Christ. There's sorrow for the absence of the moment, but we know that in eternity we'll be with all those we love in Christ in the future. Amen? So we have a sorrow, but he says, you're not sorrowing like those who have no hope. We have hope. He goes on to say, if we believe that Jesus was born, died, rose again, even so that all those that, that, that are asleep with him, he's going to bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord... Uh, you know, we're not going to prevent those who are asleep. And I said, listen, you know, the, the Lord's going to come back from glory for those. 
and he's going to receive us unto himself. He said he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, he doesn't stop there. Remember, he's talking to him about sorrow and loss of loved ones. He goes on to say, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. People say, I just don't know what to tell somebody who's lost, you know, lost someone. I, or tell them, hey, it ain't over. <laughs> it's not done. We're going to stand together. If, the Lord, if, we're not, if we don't go by death, then when the, we're here when the Lord comes. He's bringing you know, the souls of those folks we've lost back with him, and he's going to raise their bodies up out of the grave, and we're all going to be caught up in the Lord and be glorified and deliver the Lord forever and ever. There's just some hope. <laughs> the world can't offer that to you. Stock market can't offer that to you. Nothing the world would do could ever give you that kind of hope. And again, it's not, well, I hope so. No, this is, I know so. So my hope is certain. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The next gift he mentions here is the gift of peace. Luke 2, 14, he goes on to say, in peace on earth, goodwill towards men. King James says it that way, the glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The New International Version says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men upon whom his favor rests. Hit that next slide. Literally, here's what it says. His peace among men with whom he is well pleased. In other words, when you're walking with Jesus and you're right with God, you experience the peace of with God and the peace of God. John 14 was written and spoken to the disciples right before the Lord's crucifixion, before he's going to be arrested. This is right before they get to the upper room. And he's speaking to them in John 14. And there's that passage, you know, he tells, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And so where I am, you can be also. But he goes on in verse 27, that same chapter, verse, and, and he says these words, Peace I leave unto you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives unto uh, but I give it unto you. So let not your heart be troubled, neither, neither let it be afraid. Now, what's he telling him? Guys, you're getting ready to go through some hell on earth, this basic message he's been telling them. They're going to take me away. The Son of Man's going to be raised up. He's going to be crucified. And you're going to be spread out. Many of you, you know, you're going, to, you're going to scatter to the four winds. Some of you, like Peter, you're going to deny me. Judas is going to betray me. And in the midst of all this confusion, and can you imagine what happens to the disciples and in their hearts when it seems that nothing is there but doom and despair and bad news and bad situations? Jesus says, I'm going to leave you something. It's my peace. You rest in this. My peace I give unto you. It's not like the world gives peace. You say, Brother Joe, does the world give peace? The world offers peace on every hand, and it never is sustained, and it never really gives peace, and it never really changes anything. Peace of God is eternal, and the peace of God is powerful. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, we now, according to Romans, says we have peace with God. Later, the Apostle Paul says, he talks about the peace of God. Let the, let the peace of God rule in your heart and rest in your heart and reign in your life. So not only do I have peace with God, but what do I need peace with God? Because my sin was an offense to him, and it, I was under judgment, but I gave my life to Jesus, and no longer is there enmity. I, I am now a friend of God. I'm one of his children. I have peace with God. The battle is over between me and God. The battle is not over with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. But I have the peace w with God, and now while I'm in the midst of the battle with my own flesh, or with the world, or with the devil, guess what I have? I have peace. I have peace. He said, I'm going to leave you this. This is my gift to you. Now, the world does offer peace. Sometimes it comes in a bottle. Sometimes it comes in a can. Sometimes it comes in a powder. <laughs> Sometimes it comes in a needle. Sometimes it comes in an envelope. It's a big wad of money. But none of those things can give genuine, lasting, real peace. And there are people looking in all those directions. Some people think it's going to be found in relationships, if I just know enough people. Some people think it's going to be found in Social Security. God help them. It's not going to be found there. It's not going to be found at the bank. It's not going to be found in the stock market. Where's, where's your peace found? Where's your peace? I'm waiting for an answer. Where's your peace? It's in Jesus. You need to hear yourself say that more often. You need to embrace that in your life because if not today, then tomorrow or soon, you're going to go through tur turbulent times and very difficult issues in your life. And you need to come back and remember, Jesus is my peace in the midst of the storm. He is my peace. He's broken down every wall. Love that course. I have peace with God. 
And this is a peace that's enduring, and it's a peace, as I said, the world can't give it. And the old song says, the world can't take it away. Amen? So we have peace. Listen, the last century was marked with two world wars, a Vietnam conflict, a Korean conflict. The world knew nothing of peace. This century started, how? With war in, Vietnam, in Afghanistan. It's still going on. The, war, the, the wars in the Middle East are raging around the, the African continent. Everywhere in the world there's turmoil, there's strife, there's terrorism. People live in fear to walk out into a, a, to, to the streets anymore. Somebody's going to take a truck and drive them down. But you can have peace with God. The world can't offer that but Jesus Christ. Now, uh, with that, let me bring this next element of this gift because it's all wrapped up in Jesus. It's the gift of salvation. This is where you're going to find your peace. This is where your joy comes from. Salvation. Christmas is not that just that he was born. It's that he came on mission. He was born with a purpose, and it was to be, to be born, to live a life of righteousness, and then to die so that he might redeem us. He came to give his life. Hebrews says in verse, chapter 10, verse 5, Wherefore, when he comes in the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you wouldn't, but a body thou hast prepared me. What's he saying? That the, the kind of sacrifice that it would take to forgive me and forgive you of our sins so that we could have peace, so that we could have hope, so that we could be saved, was not going to be obtained by sacrificing bulls and goats and turtle doves nor by me being good enough, following ritual after ritual and code of ethic after moral code. It's not going to reach it. Someone had to pay the price for the real problem. And the real problem was that we are all sinners, condemned, and we all need a Savior. This is the message of Christmas. For unto you is born a Savior. What does a Savior do? He saves. What do I need? I need saving. You need saving. We get the best gift of all. All I could ever want and more is in my salvation. Next slide says this, Bethlehem's cradle cannot be separated from Calvary's cross. I love this passage in Acts when it's talking about the necessity of salvation and the means of salvation. It says there's no other name. You know, it's salvation and no other name under heaven given among men except by this one name whereby we must be saved. Salvation only comes through one. It's not going to come through Muhammad. It's not going to come through Buddha. It's not going to come through some, you know, a kind of religion that men have formulated and put together like Baha'i or, or Hinduism or any other religious thing. Faith, life, salvation comes one way, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to the way he puts it. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You say, well, Joe, how do I avoid hell? And how do I get to heaven? Tell you what, you must be saved. What is it? When he puts that must there, what's that mean? It means there's really no other way. This is, this is the only way. Jesus put it this way in John 3. He said, you must be born again. That's pretty, pretty specific. That's pretty entire at the same time. It shows us that there, when it's this must thing, it means there's just one way. There's no other name. Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? No man can come to the Father but by me. And praise God, it's not me out searching for him, trying to reach him. He came. This is the message of Christmas. He came. He presented himself. He offered up this body for us, this little infant born in the manger, coming by means of the cradle all the way to the cross so that you and I could be saved and you and I could know what it means to have life and peace and joy and salvation. Praise God for the cross. Now, this is what the Lord, now, obviously we could go on for days here of what this encompasses, but this is it in a nutshell, the Christmas message, all right? That, that there's this gift of, of, of hope and peace and joy and salvation. That's what the Lord has done for you. But let's think for just a moment and put it in a common mindset of what most people are doing right now at Christmas. Okay, what am I going to give so-and-so? Well, let's take it a moment. Let's remember, whose birthday is it? What, what, in realization of all that the Lord's done for us, what can we do? What can I present? I, I, I grew up in a family of six kids. You know, some of y'all might have grown up in big families. It's always sitting, interesting sitting around at Christmas and watching everybody unwrap gifts. There's that one little point that seems a little awkward when you start comparing gifts. Now, we were poor, you know, when I was growing up, so... There was a standing uh, law in our home that uh, every year the big Christmas gift would go to one child. 
And the big Christmas gift would be something like a bicycle. All right. Now, my mom was the best. She, she had a thousand things under the tree. and It'd be a little thing like a deck of cards and, you know, a toy soldier. And I think she'd buy a box of gift, a, a set, and break it into 14 different pieces and wrap each piece, you know, make it feel like we're getting a lot. So it always felt like you're getting a mountain of stuff, even being dirt poor. But, you know, I, I remember the year I got the big prize, the big present, you know, praise God. I, I was the fifth kid, but it was, it, I was six when I got the prize. I never, I'm still working on the math. So each kid's getting the, getting the big prize each year or the big present. And it was, it was cool with everybody, but I still think there was always those moments when somebody said, well, I wish I'd got that, you know. Listen, you got everything you could want with Jesus, all right? And if all you do is realize the message of Christmas, this Christmas, that's plenty for you to get this Christmas. But I think we turn around a little bit and say, okay, then what am I going to give the Lord? It's his birthday. What can I honor the Lord with? What can I honor Christ with? What can we bring? Well, if you, I want you to click through these one at a time as I talk about it. The first one, let's talk about the wise men, because they were the first guys to bring gifts, right? These were the wise men, the kingmakers from the east, and they show up, and they're there, and they bring the three gifts that we know of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? First of all, they brought gold. Now, that, they brought gold because it represented, one, the deity, the royalty, but most of all, the purity of Christ. And it's a gift of recognition. What greater, what greater gift for a pure, holy king than gold? Now, the second thing they brought was frankincense. Now, frankincense was this, a fragrant, ar aromatic gum resin that was used in worship of God. And so, obviously, he is God in the flesh. So this is the appropriate gift for them to bring. The third thing they brought was myrrh. Now, myrrh was an ointment and a, and a, and a fragrant uh, resin from trees that, that was used to, in the burial process, that when they prepare a body for, for, for burial, it would have myrrh in, in, the, in the grave clothes, and there'd be that dressing that'd be a, that would be part of, it, of the burial process. Obviously, a good gift for Jesus because he already declared in Old Testament prophecies that he was coming to be a redeemer that he would be wounded, and he would be bruised, he would be stricken and smitten and pierced with nails, and a crown of thorns would be, and a spear would pierce his side. So that, that's an appropriate gift to bring. But what's the best way for us to celebrate Christmas? Well, we can bring gold. Obviously, as you study scriptures, you talk, he says, in like in 1 Peter 1, 7, it makes reference to our faith. Our faith is more precious than gold. What is that? That's my absolute commitment and confidence. My trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord. How can, how can I honor the Lord on his birthday? I can commit my heart completely and totally to him. Not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's a commitment of my faith, my, my deep my, my deep hearted, heartfelt, full-hearted surrender to Jesus Christ, lordship of my life, and a trusting him with my life. My righteous works are even called, in 1 Corinthians 3.12, are called gold. As an, as an offering of the Lord, we present these righteous works. So what I do in my life, in my ministry, to honor the Lord, the use of my spiritual gifts, ministering to people, serving, any way in which I honor the Lord is an act of worship, and it is like gold, those obedient acts of love to the Lord. You bring Him your whole heart and faith. You bring Him your life. And then you obey him. And as you serve him in obedience, that is an act of, 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 of an offering of gold. Also, the second thing here, like the wise men, we can bring frankincense. We worship the Lord. That's the offering. In spirit and in truth, as it says in John. Psalms 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord. Can you all read the last words there? I can't hear you. At what? One more time. At all time. I will bless the Lord at all times. Now, let me paraphrase the way most people read that. I will bless the Lord at all times on Sunday morning. Because I don't go to group, lift group on Sunday night. <laughs> no, I will bless the Lord at all times. That means tomorrow morning when you roll out of bed and you're griping about your achy backs and bones, you're not going to do that. You're going to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. You know what the next verse says there? The next phrase that verse is, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. The Bible talks about a garment of praise. That is how we need to dress ourselves every day, that we wear a garment of praise, that we bless the Lord, and his praise shall continually be in the Lord. The next verse says, and my soul will make its boast in the Lord. Guess what's happening here? 
He's talking about a lifestyle of gratitude and a lifestyle of worship and a lifestyle of praise. Man, you can't get some of you folks to even praise the Lord on Sunday morning, so I know this is probably going to be hard to absorb, all right? You know, we've gone from participation. The New Testament church is supposed to be kind of a participatory thing, you know. We all participate. But what we have today is performance. People go from church to church these days looking for the best performance. Who's going to perform the best? Who's going to, who's going to, who's going to have the best light show? Who's going to have the best sound system? Who's going to have the best band? Who's going to have the best preacher? Who's going to have the best effects? Who's going to have the best mini videos, you know? And it's all performance. It's just performance. And while the church is well entertained, and the people on the stage, they most like many of them are worshiping during the performance. <laughs> but the, the people sitting watching don't worship themselves. Amen. Don't miss what you've been called to. You're, you're called to a life of praise. You're called to a life of blessing. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Now, the last phrase says this, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. What does that mean? Let me put it this way. I think it means that you're praising the Lord loud enough for somebody else to hear it. Well, like Brother Joe, I just like to worship in my heart. Well, that's a good place for it to start. But let's sign to break out. You know, it's time to break out. Because, listen, even me sharing the gospel with somebody on the street at a grocery store in a Walmart or a gas station, that's me blessing the Lord. Amen. That's me letting it out. Amen. It's me letting my light so shine before men that they can see and hear and watch what I'm doing for the glory of God. And the Bible says, and they glorify God a result of it. When's the last time you said a praise party? You, listen, the only way I can endure traffic in the morning is a praise party. I, it's either that or I'm going to backslide and hurt myself or somebody else. You know, I, I'm just that kind of guy, folks. It's my flesh. It does not like traffic. Don't look at me like that. I've watched you drive. You didn't think I was watching. <laughs> Nobody likes that mess, bumper to bumper, stalled out. I, we had a traffic jam in Magnolia. Moved out to Magnolia to get away from traffic jams. That's a, three months, there's nothing but traffic jams out there. That stupid Renaissance thing. Excuse me, Renaissance people. That stupid Renaissance thing. It just backs up everywhere. And people drive all, from all over the state to come set in traffic. And it would be all right if it wasn't near my place. <laughs> so you get out in it. I, I'm leaving my house yesterday. I'm driving into Magnolia. It's 5.30, sun's going down, beautiful evening. And as soon as I pull into Magnolia, bumper to bumper traffic. They're having a parade. Who does a parade at 530 at night? I mean, the sun's going down. But they had a parade. So it's either that, get upset, fuss, fume, complain, criticize, gripe. You know, it's kind of like watching bread mold. Or have a praise party. Amen? And it, 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 praise parties is a whole lot better. Wouldn't you agree? So if you're saying amen, that means next time you're in traffic, you're going to a praise party, right? Because <laughs> you're going to get your chance tomorrow. <laughs> Welcome to Houston. Houston, used to be in Houston, but now it's all over three counties. We can bring praise, and that ought to be our sacrifice of praise the Bible talks about. It ought to be the blessing of praise. It ought to be that we're worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And th it, but there is a, the Bible says there is a sacrifice to it. It says we offer the sacrifice of the calves of our lips. What's that mean? means that if a sacrifice is made, something has to go on the altar. What has to go on the altar? My bad attitude has to go on the altar. My stinking flesh has got to go on the altar, right? My, my arrogance and my pride, my ego, my time, that's all got to go on the altar so that I can worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It costs, though. You don't think Christmas was expensive? I'm not talking about what you might spend on your credit cards this year. I'm talking about what it costs in the time of Christ. Can you imagine Mary and Joseph even going for the collection of the taxes and the registration for all that? She's nine months pregnant riding a donkey. Some of you just came back from that part of the world. Can you imagine riding a donkey instead of that big air-conditioned Mercedes-Benz bus you're on? <laughs> pregnant nine months? It cost them when they left Bethlehem. They didn't get to go home to the comforts of home that they did have. They had to go to Egypt and live in exile for three years. It cost the mothers around Bethlehem their children because Herod came in following Jesus and he came in and slaughtered all those innocent children. It cost the wise men 
most likely months upon months of long, hard journey bearing their gifts for the Lord Jesus. It cost the apostles of the church and the early first century church their very lives as they lost their lives for the gospel message and for Christ Jesus, their Lord and Savior. It cost missionaries over the centuries. No telling how many untold stories we have before us of missionaries of Jesus who suffered untold starvation and privation and loss of life just to share the gospel to the dark corners of the world. It still costs Christian martyrs around the world this day who will die for the cause of Christ. It's an expensive thing. More than this, it costs the Lord Jesus Christ his very life as he's sent to save all men. And he offers himself as a, as a sacrifice and as a service, suffering one of the most cruel death penalties unmatched by anyone else in history. The greatest gift is this gift of Jesus, and it cost him. You share that slide. The greatest gift to give is what he has given us, and we can continue to give that gift. We can continue to give that gift. You can go ahead the next slide. If you don't, then what do you got? You've been given a gift that is very clear, clear instructions. If you read the manual, this gift is forgiving. This gift is continuing to share. We don't hold on to this gift. It becomes part of our life now. But we've been given it. Now we're ambassadors who take this same gift, like the ambassadoric messengers of the angels who shared the message to the shepherds. We now have been called upon, and now we have been placed in positions of authority in this world as God's ambassadors and as God's, God's messengers, and he lives in us to live through us to share this same message of God's great grace and peace. Listen to what Romans 10 says. How shall they call upon him whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace and who bring good tidings, glad tidings of good things. Second Corinthians is the last verse I'll share with you on the next screen. Chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. Now, what's expected of us with all these riches that we have in our life is to, in turn, share those same riches, the riches of peace, the riches of joy, the riches of salvation, the riches of God's grace with other people. What am I going to give the Lord this season? I'm going to give him a commitment of my faith, my trust, my confidence in him. I'm going to give him a gift of worship as a bear witness from the, my mouth to the world around me. I'm going to give him the gift of myrrh where I'm willing to lay down my life daily that he might be glorified in my life. Because as I give my life, I find life. Amen. I'm going to give him these things. And I think it's appropriate for us to do the same. We give out of the richness of what God's given us. He's given us so much. He's blessed me. You know, it's given, he's given me time on this planet. I need to use my time on this planet for his glory. And be, let it be redemptive. I don't want to waste my time. The Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. I want to give him my time. I want to give him from my talents. The Lord has blessed me with some talent. He's blessed you with talent. Each and every one of us have it. But not only does he give us talent, He's also given us treasures. So I share with the Lord from all three of these events. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I thank you.